on the hunt for a mid-sized family SUV with off-road capability? Well, this is the new Jeep Compass, specifically the 4xe plug-in hybrid variant. And in today's review, we'll see how it compares to the competition. <laughs> The Jeep Compass is the brand's mid-size SUV slotted between the Renegade and the Wrangler in its lineup. This second generation model originally launched in 2017 and it did so with more attractive looks and a stronger sense of off-road prowess than its predecessor. It got a facelift in 2021, comprising mainly subtle exterior design updates, plus a complete overhaul to the interior. 2022 saw the launch of the 4xe plug-in hybrid variant, the only Compass model to be equipped with four-wheel drive. Diesel's also gone, it's been chucked out of the lineup. Customers now have a choice between petrol, mild hybrid, and plug-in hybrid. So over the years, Jeep has been repositioning the Compass to compete in the extremely competitive family SUV market up against rivals like the Nissan Qashqai, Peugeot 3008, and the Skoda Karok. But is it simply able to? And how does it compare to hybrid SUV alternatives like the new Hyundai Tucson? Well, we'll find out in this review, but before we do, you can head over to the OSV website to browse the latest special offers we have available on the new Compass. And make sure to subscribe to OSV for more of our in-depth reviews. I think Jeep did a fantastic job with the 2021 refresh. The front end has an aura of sophistication about it that keeps it up to date with rivals, yet it has rugged appeal thanks to the presence of the trademark seven slotted grille that merges seamlessly with the slim LED headlights. Those come standard by the way, and they're complemented by the bold front bumper. You'll also spot the prominent Trailhawk badging on the bonnet with this particular variant. So by taking a look at pictures of the Compass, you may think it's a large SUV, but in person, it's not as large as those pictures made out. At 4,404 millimeters in length, it is shorter than the new Nissan Qashqai. It is quite a bit wider though, and height-wise it comes out around the same. Ground clearance, 198 millimeters. That's around 20 millimeters less than the Range Rover Evoque, and it has a wading depth of 406 millimeters. Pretty decent for a vehicle of this class, but not as good as the Volvo XC40, or even this car's sibling, the Renegade Trailhawk. Alloy wheels range from 17 to 19 inches in size. With our Trailhawk, Hawk variant, we have 17 inch off-road alloy wheels. They do a brilliant job at smoothing out light undulations around town, as well as absorbing the harsh impact of humps and bumps and aggressive potholes. They're surrounded by squared off wheel arches, which at the side profile give the compass the look of a shrunken down Grand Cherokee. There's a variety of different body colors to choose from with the new compass, including this nice shade of Colorado red, which sits as a nice backdrop to the trail rated 4x4 badging we have dotted around this Trailhawk variant. As standard, your new compass will come with auto folding and heated door mirrors. You can also have these integrated with blind spot monitoring, more on that later. You also get black roof rails and tinted rear privacy glass. Not much to say about the rear end. I think Jeep could have done more here to make it look a little bit more muscular and aggressive, but I do like how the taillights merge around from the side and onto the tailgate and the prominently displayed 4xe and Trailhawk badging, just bringing out that rugged appeal a bit more. The Compass rewards you with a boot space of 438 litres. Now compared to the Renegade, that is quite a bit more. That car gives you 351 litres, but in comparison to equivalent family SUVs, it does fall a bit short. For example, the Peugeot 3008 gives you 520 litres and the new Nissan Qashqai 504 litres. It's worth noting, if you go with the hybrid model, you do lose a tiny bit of storage space, not much though, due to batteries running underneath the floor. Upon opening the automatic tailgate that's available with high spec grades, you can see that the load space itself is incredibly wide and handily square shaped, making it easy to load awkwardly shaped and sized items into the back. So let's try loading in this carry-on suitcase. Now you can see already that I've got quite a high loading lip to contend with due to the raised ride height for that ground clearance. It's gonna test out those muscles in your arms. But once you manage to lift it into the back, they slide in quite nicely. 
nicely. Easily enough room there for four to five of those carry-on luggage, around three, possibly four adult suitcases. So we have lots of hooks dotted around this compartment to strap objects down I like to roll around. There's also a little area to the left-hand side there, perfect for those rolling objects. Disappointment I have is that with this variant, we have a spare tire underneath the floor. So there is some underfloor storage, but that is all taken up by that tire with the maintenance kit. This means we don't have a dedicated space for the charging cables with this plug-in hybrid variant. They are in these rather bulky bags, which as you can see, are taking up nearly half of the boot space here. If you need to fit a bike or a buggy into the back, you will likely have to fold down the rear seats, and you can do, but not from here. It's a bit of a faff. You have to climb over the parcel shelf. It's just not worth it. Just go around to the side. You'll be able to toggle the levers from there. The seats then fold down in a 60-40 arrangement. But if you go with the top spec S grade model, you'll be able to fold down the seats in a 40-20-40 arrangement. That means you can fold down the middle seat independently, sliding long objects through, like skis and golf clubs, into the rear cabin space. With the seats completely folded, you can see that there are a slight incline, unfortunately, they don't fold completely flat, and there is a rather awkward gap in the floor. Thankfully, you do get an adjustable height boot floor, and if you don't have a massive wheel underneath that, you will be able to sort the floor out so it sits completely flush with the seat, so there's no awkward gap created there. But this is a really nice space that's been created now, easily enough room for two adult bikes if you take the wheel off, and a large buggy. It's rare that you'll come across a plug-in hybrid model that can tow, but the 4xe certainly can, and it can tow a trailer up to 1,250 kilograms. If you opt for the 1.3 litre pure petrol version, which I'll talk about in just a moment, you'll be able to tow up to 1,750 kg. Really impressed with the levels of practicality on offer, guys. While it may pale in comparison to other rivals in some areas, there's still a lot of space in there for your weekly grocery shop and for dog walks. And coupled with the off-road capability, I think that's brilliant. Right, we know it's practical, but how does it drive on UK roads, considering this is an off-roader? Let's get behind the wheel. Okay guys, there's three different powertrain options available with the new Compass. Let's start by talking about the pure petrol. It's a 1.3 litre unit generating 130 horsepower and 270 newton metres of torque for a decent 0 to 62 time of 10.3 seconds. That's pretty standard for a uh, equivalent sized engine that you'll find in similar rivals. Sadly, this can't be had with all wheel drive capability, just front wheel drive, and it's mated to six speed manual transmission. CO2 output is quite high for this model, around 159 grams per kilometer. So if you are looking at the new Compass as your new company car, you will want to look more towards the e-hybrid and plug-in hybrid variants. Next up guys, we have the e-hybrid variant pairing a 1.5 litre engine with a small battery pack and electric motor. This generates 130 horsepower and 240 newton meters of torque for a slightly improved zero to 62 time of 10 seconds. Sadly, once again, can't be had with all wheel drive, but we do see a significant improvement to fuel economy here. Uh, you'll be achieving around 46 miles per gallon on the combined cycle. That is comparable with other mild hybrid variants uh, you'll get with equivalent rivals. Sewer two output, slightly reduced as well, one, around 136 grams per kilometer. And finally, we have the new plug-in hybrid variant which can be had with all-wheel drive capability. This pairs the 1.3 litre engine with a much beefier 11.4 kilowatt hour battery pack. This can be consistently recharged while you drive along through deceleration thanks to the regenerative braking system. You can also plug it into your domestic socket at home to charge up or a rapid charging point when you're out and about. Power is boosted to 240 horsepower and 270 newton meters of torque for a much much improved 0 to 62 time of 7.3 seconds. Now that sounds great and it mainly is, uh, particularly around town, it's enough zip to nip you into tight gaps in traffic, but sadly due to the hybrid system prioritizing fuel economy, it does limit the potential of that performance and you'll find that you have to put your foot down quite hard on the accelerator to actually get anywhere. The system is driven via six speed automatic transmission and as it's plug-in hybrid, you can drive purely off that battery pack for an all electric range of up to 30 miles. And that's pretty competitive with other plug-in hybrid rivals out there and not as good as the new Hyundai Tucson that can offer a pretty much class leading plug-in hybrid range of up to 38 miles. 
CO2 emission output has been significantly reduced with this variant, making it one of the best Jeeps to buy if you're after a new company car. Jeep quotes a figure of 46 grams per kilometer, placing it in a very promising benefit in kind tax band for 2022 to 2023. Hybrid variants of the Jeep Compass can take advantage of regen braking, very ideal for driving at slow speeds in pure electric mode around town, and it's also great for city driving. It does this by harvesting energy that would otherwise be lost through deceleration, braking, and coasting back into that battery pack. And this means with the e-hybrid variant, you don't need to plug in your Jeep whatsoever. It will constantly keep topping itself up. And you'll find with the plug-in hybrid model that if your daily commute is around 10 to 20 miles, that you won't need to plug it in as frequently to charge. You can just allow that battery pack to top up over time, and it will. When it comes to charging your plug-in hybrid model, you can plug it into a domestic free pin plug at your home, in which case it will take around nine to 10 hours to do a zero to 100% charge. Not too bad if you remember to plug it in when you get home from work and it will be topped up for you ready the next day. If you'd like it to charge faster, consider installing a 2.3 kilowatt wall box either at your workplace or um, in your garage and it will do a zero to full charge in four hours, so significantly improved there. The Compass plug-in hybrid supports charging capability up to 7.4 kilowatts. Uh, you can either do this from a wall box or a rapid charging point you'd find at a motorway service station or supermarket car park, in which case it will do a zero to flat charge in around an hour and 40 minutes. Now that's probably a a bit too long for spending at a motorway service station. There's multiple driving modes to select and you do so via the switch located, well, hidden behind the automatic lever. First up, we've got auto. It's your default setting for everyday driving. It's what you want to keep it in for the most of your time, especially when you're driving around town. That will help you maximize fuel economy. Next up is sport and that sharpens throttle response. It tightens the steering and it adjusts the transmission behavior to ensure that you take advantage of the maximum power on offer. And indeed, when you put it in this mode, it can make the compass quite fun to wind down through country roads, but it's certainly not the most engaging SUV on the market, not for Puma levels of quality. Then we have the terrain mode. Snow will take advantage of the all-wheel drive system and in such conditions it will help reduce oversteer and provide optimal stability and traction. Similar setup to the sand and mud mode except here it will manage wheel spin so you can take full control on uneven slippery surfaces. Rock mode is only available with Trailhawk models and this continuously adjusts the electric torque output to help you tackle even the most challenging of terrain. And this is one of my favorite favorite aspects of the Compass 4xe is it hasn't lost its off-road capability despite repositioning itself in that family SUV market. There's a lot of rivals out there that claim to have off-road capability because they've got four-wheel drive and they've got some terrain modes, but this is a proper off-roader at heart and Jeep haven't lost that. The suspension setup is quite similar to other family SUVs out there. Around town, it absorbs nice undulations nicely, as well as the impact of large humps and bumps. Of course, though, off-road is where it performs best. It's quite a firm ride, certainly not as soft and cosseting as other family SUVs out there, but that works to the Jeep's advantage because none of the Im impacts of potholes and harsh abrasions find their way into the cabin. Sadly, there's certain improvements that could be made to the steering setup. It's light, which makes this rather bulky SUV quite easy to maneuver around town and into and out of tight spaces. But fortunately, it lacks any kind of feel and doesn't instill much confidence as a result on more challenging terrain. Body lean is also quite severe when navigating through sharp corners and bends. The side bolsters aren't prominent enough to hold you in place, so you'll find yourself in the corner over here by the window. The alignment of the pedals could be improved too. There's not a lot of space for your left foot with automatic transmission models, though both the accelerator and the brake feel great. They are firm, so it's easy to gauge how much pressure you need to provide in order to either accelerate or slow down. Let's talk about noise at higher speeds on the motorway and dual carriageway. If you've opted for the larger 19-inch alloy wheels, you'll hear quite a lot of road noise start seeping into the cabin. If you've opted for the standard 18-inch wheels, this is made significantly better. Wind noise is quite prevalent at those high speeds too. You'll hear some bellowing from around the mirrors and the windscreen pillars. 
Also, compared to other hybrid models out there, the transition from the hybrid system to engine power isn't as smooth and seamless as I would like as you hear the engine kick in with a loud roar, and it sounds rather coarse, it's rather unpleasant. It also sends a bit of vibration throughout the cabin. You'll feel that through the pedals and the steering wheel. Visibility is excellent, and you can pump yourself up high with that seat adjustment and get a lofty view of the road ahead over that bonnet. I wish these side pillars weren't as chunky. They do obscure your view a little bit at junctions and roundabouts. This easily could have been remedied though by having a bit of quarter glass here to see corners easier. Mirrors are a really nice size though, giving you a great view of what's behind you. View out the back window isn't too bad and my over the shoulder view is decent, slightly obscured by a chunky rear pillar. Thankfully, you get a rear view camera as standard. Often this is locked behind more expensive trim levels or an optional pack. Okay guys, let's demonstrate the standard rear view camera. As you can see, we've got guidelines appearing on the infotainment display, helping us navigate into a, well, it's not even a tight gap, but it will be a tight gap in a car park. They're really helpful. This is quite a bulky SUV, so it's great to have that over uh, bird's eye view there of the vehicle. And you can change the, uh, the position of the camera like so, so you can have a rear view, more of kind of like a fisheye view there, and a full screen if you want as well really handy for maneuvering this bulky SUV. When it comes to safety, the Compass was assessed by Euro NCAP and it was awarded the maximum five stars. It scored really well in the adult and child occupant tests, 90 and 83% respectively. Indeed, it comes equipped with over 70 passive and active safety systems. Standard ones include automatic emergency braking, forward collision warning, and lane departure warning. Pricier trim levels offer more advanced safety kits such as adaptive cruise control, blind spot monitoring, in which signals are implemented on the door mirrors to alert you of vehicles passing close by, and traffic sign recognition. Jeep offers a fairly standard three year warranty, similar to what other manufacturers in the UK offer. What should reassure you if you go with the plug-in hybrid variant is you get eight years or 100,000 miles of coverage for the battery pack. There's a good amount of material variety on display and it all comes together quite nicely. Like the soft touch plastics up here on the dashboard, nice textured effect here running across the bottom of the display accompanied by red stitching that you get with the Trailhawk model. Love the design of those air vents, piano black, and they work their way across the entire width of the dash and more piano black down here in the center console. Nothing too flashy, nothing that we haven't seen before but it's nice and a definite improvement over the predecessor. The front space isn't as wide as it is with the Tucson or the cash car, but it's wide enough. There's enough room to stretch out and find a comfortable position for you. Headroom is excellent. I'm 5'8", and if I set up, as you can see, absolutely miles away from that roof lining. Worth noting that you can spec the optional panoramic sunroof. That's gonna trim a couple of centimeters off there. May wanna take that into account if you're over six foot. On all but the top spec S models, the seats are manually adjustable allowing you to find a very comfortable position very quickly. You can pump yourself up high like so. We can keep going, still going. That's the highest point there. That's providing a brilliant view of the road ahead. But if you'd like to sit lower down to provide a more engaging drive for yourself, that's certainly an option here. It's also great to see that lumbar support comes as standard, though it's only one way. If you want four-way power lumbar support, you have to go with that top spec S model. You get a leather steering wheel, feels nice and premium, and I like the red stitching surrounding it. On the left-hand side, media controls. On the right, cruise controls. Behind the wheel, we have a 10.25 inch display that shows you key information you wanna see while on the go, like you can have navigation instruction sharp here, plus your fuel economy figures. But it's a bit of a jam-packed screen. There's so much being thrown at you, so much information. And with these screens, you want them to be simplified so you can glance down and get the information that you want to see. On the bright side, there's plenty of options to cycle through here. You can personalize this to quite a good degree. This is complemented by the 10.1 inch full HD touchscreen. It comes courtesy of the new fifth generation Uconnect infotainment system. This has usual gubbins such as DAB radio, Bluetooth, plus wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. I love to see that in new cars and perhaps it'd be something you'll be relying on. This is because Jeep software, I'd say is around mid tier. It works well for those basic functions but there is a bit of lag when navigating around. The graphics aren't as sharp as I would like, and it's just not as refined as rival systems you get in equivalent models. 
The navigation is quite good. You get speed camera alerts as well as live traffic updates, information on fuel stops and the weather. One thing I don't really like though is as you can see it's angled towards the left hand side, actually angled towards the front passenger. And that's because with our UK market model, Jeep didn't bother to reposition the screen towards the driver. So this is how it would be for left hand drive vehicles. That's a bit annoying because it can make some of those options a little bit tricky to see when glancing down while on the go. While the majority of functions are incorporated into this infotainment, it is great to see that we've got some physical buttons here. Lots of those are for the climate control. We've got a scroll wheel here for adjusting the air intensity, nice large clicky buttons for the temperature. Uh, we've got some for the volume as well and the tuner for the radio. So it's nice to have all these in a cluster below the display play that when you adjust the air intensity that will show up on the screen there we're going to like a climate control section and um, where you can dive into the options in a bit more detail the standard sound system is decent if sound is something that's important to you you can spec the optional 506 watt premium audio system for more immersive experience inside Using the Jeep app, you can register your compass to locate it remotely, receive real-time information along your route, and manage charging operations either at home or at a public station. High spec grades reward you with a wireless charging pad just down here. It's a nice compartment as well. It's enough room to fit other bits and bobs. Just above that, you've got a USB-C port and a USB-A port, plus buttons to access the hybrid, electric or e-save drive modes. Electric will allow you to drive purely off the battery pack with this plug-in hybrid variant, and e-save will ensure you're maximizing fuel economy. Hybrid is a nice mix of engine and battery power. Behind that, we've got our automatic gear selector, our electronic parking brake, our drive mode select switch plus buttons for hill hold and four wheel drive lock couple of cup holders nice and rugged good size on them too easily swallowing up my bulky bottle like so center compartment is a decent size we lift that up and it goes down really far actually i would like to see a 12 volt socket in here but hey ho kind of everything glove box nice size on that too actually i mean it's not large but it goes in rather deep plenty of room for all your bits and bobs and the door bins are really good size too. I like the seats with this Trailhawk model. They're decently comfortable, nice use of upholstered material, and I could easily sit in them for a long journey. The new compass is 70 millimeters longer between the front and rear wheels than the Renegade. Has that freed up some space inside then? Well, yes, actually. I think this is a really comfortable rear compartment. Lots of leg room on offer. I can't stretch out completely, but I'm nearly there. And the bottom of those seats have some nice upholstery that's brushed against my legs also it's a very wide space so i can stretch out and get comfortable headroom is still quite good not as good as it is in the front so i am approaching that roof lining if you plan on having passengers who are six foot over in the back maybe don't go with that sunroof as they might just be touching the top the doors open nice and wide as you can see around 75 to 80 degrees there so loading kids seats into the back really really easy guys and then you can attach them to the isofix fittings on either chair those are the ones where you have to slide the seat under and click them in place might be a bit of a faff at first but once they're in you won't have to move that around other nice tees include pouches on the back or the front seats nice material on them and they go down quite far let's see if they fit my bottle hopefully they do yeah nice and snug in there Door bins, smaller than they are in the front, but still a good size. You could comfortably, comfortably fit a 250ml bottle in there. If there's no middle passenger, we can fold down this middle compartment here, rewarding us with an armrest and a couple of cup holders, though these look a little bit too small. Yeah, a bit too small for that bottle. Perfect for a coffee cup, though. And you get a central air conditioning cluster here where we can adjust the air intensity on the fly. That's accompanied by a USB-C and USB-A socket. Plus, down here, we've got a 12 volt socket and a European plug. So yes guys, enough space for two adults to comfortably sit in the back here, but what happens if you need to squeeze a third one in for those family holidays, family getaways, whatever you're doing? Let's slide on over and see what it's gonna be like for them. Well, this is a rather strange middle seat. You've got slight bolsters here, as you can see, and uh, because I've got quite a large rear end, I am colliding with those, and that's quite uncomfortable. There is a transmission tunnel, but it's weirdly shaped. It kind of seeps out from the sides. It's not just a square tunnel that you see in a lot of other cars. So that means you have to put your legs quite far out, encroaching on the personal space of those other passengers. Um, but comfort-wise, not too bad. I could sit here for about an hour or so. 
The Compass offers multiple trim levels and options, so let's dive into those as well as talk about pricing. Night Eagle models start from £33,700 and you get 18 inch gloss black alloy wheels, LED headlights and a rear view camera. For an extra £1,000 you can upgrade to the limited trim level that adds wireless phone charging and adaptive cruise control plus much more. Mid-range upland trims start from around £41,500 and comprise mostly of cosmetic changes to the exterior including the option to configure the new Mata Azor exterior body colour with a two-tone black roof plus you get navigation for the infotainment display. For the same price you can go with this Trailhawk variant that really shows off the off-road capability of the Compass with trail hawk and trail rated badging dotted around the exterior, 17 inch off-road alloy wheels with mud and snow tyres, the terrain drive select button rear rock mode that only comes with this variant plus red stitching for those cloth and vinyl seats. Top spec S trim start from £42,500 and you really maximise your configuration here with a hands-free tailgate, 19 inch satin grey alloy wheels and 40-20-40 folding seats. If you need a hand finding your perfect Jeep Compass specification, then just get in touch with our team via the link in the description box below. Okay guys, should you consider buying, leasing or financing the Jeep Compass 4xe plug-in hybrid? Well, there are a lot of things to admire about this rugged family SUV. For one, me, it's the looks, and I know that's subjective, but I think this delivers a really nice combination of sophistication and off-road appeal. It works really well. But I think my favorite thing about the new Compass is that it's a true off-roader. With a lot of vehicles out there, brands claim that they offer off-road capability. You know, you can drive them off into the sunset and you'll be absolutely fine. And that's just not the case. Yet the Compass delivers that, plus a lot of the things that family car buyers are after. Really generously sized boot space, spacious cabin for rear passengers, a nice and wide front space too for the driver and front passenger, lots of tech to play around, it's all very comfortable, ticking a lot of those boxes, plus it's very well equipped as standard too with a rear view camera and driver lumbar support. For me, the biggest downside comes in the form of engine refinement. Sadly, it's simply not as smooth as I would like to drive. The infotainment system, while decent, isn't as good as you get in rival vehicles like the Nissan Qashqai and the Hyundai Tucson and you do pay quite a premium for this plug-in hybrid all-wheel drive variant. It's around £5,000 more expensive than the Hyundai Tucson plug-in hybrid. So you'll need to weigh up if this car's off-road capability plus everything else that it does well is ticking more of your boxes than those more affordable options. Overall, if you're in the market for a new family SUV, don't let this pass you by, especially if you like venturing outdoors for hikes and dog walks, and you need a vehicle that could take a little bit more of a beating than what you have now, then this is a really good option. If you'd like to dive into the Compass range in more detail, guys, find the specification that suits your needs perfectly, then just get in touch with our vehicle specialist via the number in the banner below. Alternatively, you can just click that pop-up banner hanging out up there to book a call at a time that best works for you and head down to the link in the description box below to go over to the OSV website and browse the hottest lease deals we have available on the new Compass. Thanks for watching our Compass review guys. If you found it helpful, give it a thumbs up. Also subscribe to the OSV channel, that way you won't miss out on our brand new in-depth reviews. Once you're on board, there's a notification bell down there. When you click it, you'll get notified when we upload the next video. That's it, thanks for watching, take care and safe driving.